Aha. Uh-huh. I, 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 we went live, buddy, but I, you, you're right. I, 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 because I switched screens, I lost my checklist. Hey, you're, uh, I won't go through the whole spiel again, but you're <laughs> live on Lunch Conversations with Randy and Teddy, and our sponsor is the Elder Law Firm, and our special guest is Dennis Toman. Dude, Randy, Dennis, thanks for being on here. Give me a minute to, to get Randy in check and make sure he's doing it right. Um, <laughs> would you tell Shame on audience? you, Teddy. Shame <laughs> on you. No, I, I see. I think we've got it on LinkedIn. I think it was uh, sharing live um, anyway. But at the end, the end game, Teddy, is that uh, wherever we are, that's where it is. And uh, that that's the way it's going to be. So when we're done, you're going to upload it and we'll be able to share it. But if you can't yeah. catch it live uh, on streaming on uh, Facebook, it'll be on YouTube LinkedIn. and Facebook it'll be, it'll and LinkedIn. Be elsewhere. It'll be on seven podcasts. Yep. We're syndicated globally, and uh, it's pretty cool stuff. Would you tell the audience, we have uh, yeah. uh, thousands of people, who the heck are you, dude? Yeah, uh, Randy Wooden with Goodwill Industries of Northwest North Carolina. We are a 31 county. Yeah. It's a huge Goodwill. Uh, we run everywhere from Forsyth County, Winston-Salem, everything north and west in the state of North Carolina. And I happen to run our professional center. I, we started, I started it back in 2012. And like I say, Teddy, you know, every one, month and week, they still keep paying me. So I still keep doing it. But yeah, if you uh, or somebody you know, professional in a in job search, we're free. Work by appointment. I don't care where you live, but most of our clients are here in the triad. Uh, reach out to me. Find me on LinkedIn. We're happy to happy to help you, and we're happy to have Dennis join us today. And um, Teddy, while you're working on that, Dennis, why don't you introduce yourself? And I'm going to ask the why question because, well, I can. So, Dennis, who are you? What are you doing here anyway? Yeah, so um, I'm glad to be here and, and thrilled to be able to be uh, you know say that we're part of your show and uh, think that you do uh, great things through the show and um, are entertaining if if not also informative too so that's that's fantastic um yes yeah, so I'm, I'm dennis toman i'm a lawyer with the elder law firm started the elder law firm back in, um this is our 20th anniversary this year so 20 years ago started this firm and practiced law before then um and uh you know we we work primarily with the state planning elder law elder care issues um you know um, guardianships that sort of thing um here in, in greensboro and surrounding communities and it's, it's been something I've enjoyed doing, um, and I'm glad to do it. So I always ask the why question, Dennis. I mean, you've been at this for, like I said, for a very long time now. Was there something in your youth or something you encountered in early adulthood or something that's kind of pointed you in this direction to say, you know what, there's a, a need, a desire, a want to uh, help us understand the why? Yeah, well, that's a good question because, I, I mean, a lot of times people do ask, you know, why'd you be an elder law attorney? And the fact is, I never planned to be an elder law attorney. That wasn't that's the thing that I grew up saying I was going to do. Um, but I, I look back and there's a couple of different things that issues, uh, things that came along. You know, first of all, I had a great relationship with all four of my grandparents and looking yeah. back mm-hmm. and just understanding that, you know, as a young child, even, you know, it was important to me that uh, they were in situations where, um, you know, they, they enjoyed life. They had, uh, you know, uh, family around, able to help. And uh, just lived on a farm. I both of them lived on farms, and so got to experience that farm life too. But it was that that sense of family, really, that that drove a lot of that. And um, you know, I went to uh, you know uh, got an accounting degree because I knew I wanted to do business and tax law when I came out. And yep. so that's what I did. I got an accounting degree, did, got my law degree, came out, did business and tax. And I had a client one time who called me up, and, and he had small business. And said he was worried he was going to lose the house because his wife was needing care in a nursing home. And he wanted her to get that care, but he couldn't afford it. And would he lose the house? Would he have money he could live on? What would happen? And this was back over 20 years ago when elder law is still very, very new. And told him, I don't know, um, but I'm sure there's something we can do. If we, uh, you know, work on this together, we can probably figure it out. And that's what we did. Read the books, talked to other lawyers. Mm-hmm. Got a good result and helped him. He was thrilled. I enjoyed doing it. Um, felt it was a very worthwhile thing working with him personally and finding a good personal result for him and kept doing it. The more I did that, the less corporate tax law I did until this is all that we do. That's all you do. And before I throw it back to Teddy, because Teddy's going to kind of drive the, the conversation, I want to encourage 
uh, our attendees by the thousands that are tuning in. If you have comments or questions, please put them in there in the uh, in the chat, and we'll we'll work those in with Dennis where appropriate. But uh, I don't care where you are in life. If you're real young and you have aging parents, or you yourself are aging a bit, and it's this this pertains to really any dinner demographic. So this is going to be a good conversation. Teddy, let me throw it to you and let's get, uh, let's get this underway. Cool stuff. So, yep. um, so Dennis, elder law, tell me what that means. Just define that at a high level. Yeah. At, at a high level, it really means planning for the second half of life. Um, and so looking ahead to how are things going to work out? Um, if a person, um, you know, is unable to make their own decisions, if they're going to need care, if they want to make sure that their estate is settled in a way that's the easiest um, and most efficient way and, and less, cost, uh, less costly. Um, all those things are uh, bear consideration. And that's really what elder law um, deals with. But another way, word for it is elder care law. Yeah. And that's a lot of what we deal with. Yeah. yeah. It, it's all about uh, the planning, the systems, the resources, um, that cover lots of different areas of, and I appreciate you said that because Chan asked the question, are you focused on the, the last quarter? And it sounds like it's bigger than that. It's the last half. You know? Well, nobody wants to think about the last quarter, but they're willing to think about the last half on yeah. occasion. Yeah. So that's, that's certainly the case. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So, all right. There's a lot that goes into this whole picture, a whole lot. I mean, I, I would wager that over the years, you've discovered that it just keeps growing. The things that you have to do, the things that are important. Um, and, and a lot of that is including documentation. So talk a little bit if you could about what, is the, what kind of documentation is important in this, in this process? Yeah, so a good question. And again, the um, idea is that people need to be prepared. And if they're not going to be able to be there making their own decisions and saying what needs to happen, then they need to have taken the time to put into place uh, the right type of documents with the right type of, type of language with some you know, forethought and advice that are going to make things where their wishes are respected and um, things turn out easier for them as well as for their family. And so having those documents in place is just absolutely critical. So wait a minute. So I'm going to be facetious, I think is the right word. And one day I'll look up the true definition of that, so I'll make sure I'm using the word right. Can I just go on the internet and download these documents and just fill them out and print them and file them somewhere? You, you certainly can. There's lots of things a person can do on the internet that aren't a good idea, and that typically is one of them. Um, and so the, you know, the... The, these aren't just documents. Um, it's, it's not just, I need to have a will, I need to have a power of attorney. We need to have the right documents and we need to make sure that we've done it in the proper way. I just had a situation not too long ago where somebody brought in a, a power of attorney that they had done online and they'd actually um, had it signed at their bank. And their bank later said, well, this power of attorney is not any good. And they said, well, wait a minute, you know, you, you helped us sign it, we've been using all that. Well, they had done it online and they had checked one box wrong on the online version and it did. It made it so that the power of attorney was no good, but they had no idea. And it came up later when it was really too late to do anything about it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Wow. So, yeah. Gu guidance is important. Um, I'm with you, buddy. Um, so let's talk about that for a minute. Um, you and I talked about it and you didn't say power of attorney. You said powers of attorney. So Correct. are there different types that, that you know, we need to make sure we have? Yeah. So one of the, the big things that we um, come up against is people don't understand that they need a power of attorney, a power of attorney. Um, the, the idea that, well, my wife knows what I want or my husband knows what I want or my kids can do this. The fact is that in North Carolina, as in most states, that if you've not taken the time to have in place your powers of attorney, then the law presumes that you wanted the courts to step in with a guardianship that is costly, time consuming, uh, tears families apart and involves just tons of red tape. And so um, yeah, taking the time to do the right powers of attorney is absolutely critical. And there are, there's two types. One is a financial power of attorney and the other is a healthcare power oh, of attorney. Yeah. 
right? And that the financial power of attorney is there to make sure that the, the finances, the uh, dealing with real estate, paying bills, uh, signing contracts, all of that is taken care of and someone has the authority to act on your behalf if you're unable to do so. And on the other hand, the medical or healthcare power of attorney is to make medical decisions. Yeah, I get it. And now, and again, I'm just thinking off the top of my head while and you know out there, <clears throat> I would I would imagine that sometimes these powers of attorney could be family members and or not. True. Um, so the, the idea of having a power of attorney is what happens if a person is unable to make their own decisions or needs care, how, we, how are things going to turn out? And um, almost always, we, uh, and it's going to be a family member who's going to be the agent. Um, and so the question is going to be who to choose yeah. as the agent. Um, and and that, it's not necessarily the oldest child. It's not necessarily the child that's the closest. Typically, if it's a married couple, it's going to be one spouse for the other spouse mm -hmm. uh, to be the power of attorney. And then it's a question of, well, what's the job and who's right for the job? Yeah. Um, and sometimes the, you know, there's one child that stands out that they could do this the best, but it needs to be something that, that they're comfortable with doing too. And so it, it all bears a conversation um, with the family about how to do this. One thing, Randy, that comes up a lot of times is, well, I've got, you know, three children. Can I make them all my agents to make these decisions together? And, um, and, and, and Teddy, that, that when we're dealing with this too, um, you know, the question would then be, well, why? Yeah. You know, why, do they get along? And the answer is no, they don't get along. I want to have them all act together. That's why I want to name them all together. And that's generally a bad idea. We can name co-agents, but we've got to make sure that they get along first. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah. I, I, that's why I brought the question up. Not that I have that, that issue, but I, I can picture that there are always families out there who having one of their your children or a family member be in your power of attorneys mm -hmm. may not be the right answer. And uh, so am I right? Are, are there are there agents who are hired or contracted agents for power attorneys? Yeah, it, it is on occasion. Um, we can do that. And we, we typically incorporate that in with some of the trust planning. If that's going to be um, a third party as trustee, then the financial power of attorney piece works in well with that too. Yeah. 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 But the bottom line is you, you better have your plan in place for your powers of attorney or somebody else is going to take control and, and maybe make decisions that you wish weren't made. Yeah. Exactly. Hey, just to chime in here real quick, if you have a comment or a question for Dennis, we'd like to have you put them in the chat area, and I'll keep an eye on that <clears> to see what uh, what comes in and try to work those in as as we can. Teddy, throw it back to you. Good stuff, buddy. Good. So, hey, Randy, you you, you did good, man. Threw it back to me. Ask and you <laughs> shall receive. <laughs> I see, try. I'm and you shall find. All right. Yeah. So, Dennis, wills. I mean, this is really no a no brainer in my feeble mind. I, you know, I I, I wrote down a list of all the assets that I have. It's it summed up to a dollar thirty seven cents. I listed my daughter's names on a piece of paper, and I said, when I die, they all divide it up and get whatever's left. I signed it, I notarized it, and I put it in a freaking file folder. I'm sure that it's way more than that. Yeah, so uh, a of course, the, the important documents for everybody to have a will, financial power of attorney, healthcare power of attorney, living will, and a medical privacy release to cover the HIPAA um, confidentiality requirements. So we want to do that. But believe it or not, even though most people focus on the will, as being, you know, that's what they need to do. That's probably the least important document uh, for most people, because even if they don't have a will, the state has one for them. And typically it's going to do exactly what they would have done otherwise, which is leave everything to their, their, um, their children equally. Yeah. Um, and, and the will though becomes important if that's not what we want to do. If we want to do something special, or we want to make sure that we have named a particular child to be the executor of the estate, then we definitely need to have that will in place. 
Unfortunately, many people stop with the will and they presume, well, the will's good enough, we've got what we need, and they don't get the other documents and they also don't look ahead to some of the trust planning issues, which actually wind up avoiding some of the big problems that wills present when we've got an estate that you know, we need to worry about um, you know, um, assets that are gonna have to go through probate and what, all, what that's gonna involve. Yeah. There is a question here if we can, that's, yeah, we have some time, we'll work that in. Don had a question, he said, uh, well, a statement, first of all, he said, families are, are often faced with getting uh, caregivers. Uh, they also have to get someone to help and are given power of attorney and durable power of attorney and medical power of attorney. So if I'm the one who has that power now, do does that person, me, do I have with th that power of attorney, do I have the responsibility to notify my aging parent or, you know, the, the assisted person of any changes of the beneficiaries? Or, I mean, do I have to notify them that I, I made Teddy Burris? who's going to split the pot with me, uh, the, the, the new beneficiary? Yeah, so I think that the situation that's being asked is um, mm -hmm. where we've got a parent who's needing care yeah. or maybe not be able to handle uh, matters entirely on their own, and we've named somebody as a power of attorney. In that situation, that agent's authority depends on the language in the power of attorney. And so there's no one-size-fits-all. There are statutory short-form powers of attorney. Mm -hmm. which tend to fall short when it comes to doing some of the uh, Medicaid planning and asset preservation that we often want to be able to do. Um, but the, the short answer is that the agent can, has to act on in the best interest of the, the person who signed the power of attorney, typically the parent. Yeah. And, and there, there, are, there are some obligations to report back to the individual and that'll be covered by the language in the power of attorney too. Yeah, got it, got, got it, yeah. Got another question too, if you um, want to tackle it. Teddy, it's yeah. up to you. you yeah, let's you know, go with it because it. it um, Mike asked a question that, uh, so cue it up, Randy. That yeah, he says, hey, look, he says, my mom is 86 and we are putting her assets in a trust. Now in Kentucky, it takes five years for that to become in force. So are her assets at risk prior or should we seek another option? Well, now we do have a will, a living will and medical and financial powers of attorney already in place. So what about that five-year wait time, I guess? Is that an issue? Well, it sounds like you're getting good advice and good help um, in Kentucky. And every state's laws are different. Um, and But as a general matter, probably what this is dealing with is actually the trust is in effect when it, when it gets started and the assets get put into the trust. But the concern is that for Medicaid purposes, there's a five-year look back. Mm. And what that means is that by transferring assets into the trust and reducing the amount of assets actually in mom's name, Medicaid is going to say, fine, you can make a gift. But if you apply for care, if you apply for financial assistance within the next five years after making that gift, then we're going to impose a period of ineligibility yeah. on, those, on those financial benefits. And so um, by setting up that trust, putting assets in the trust, what they've really done is they have removed those assets from mom's name. That's effective now. And they've started a five-year clock running for Medicaid. If something, heaven forbid, mom were to need care between now and five years from now, then you'd have to readjust. And there are certainly ways to do that. Um, yeah. So that sounds like a, a good start and a good plan. Yeah. yeah. So we'll take the next one in a minute, Ray. So that, that aligns, Dennis, with this whole conversation of preserving your assets and how to properly hand down your money. I'll tell you a story I, I recently uh, heard about from, a, from a, a, a family, not my family, but a family. And that was um, the, um, the, the parents both died off within a two year period. And nobody had any pre-thought of how to transfer that money to the next yeah. generation. And so, you know, the, the money got transferred to and distributed amongst the kids. Well, nobody really even paid attention to the fact that that money was in retirement funds. And so these family members got this money, took it, put it in their checking accounts, put it in their own investment vehicles, um, that were not retirement funds and got hit with huge tax liability. So talk a little bit about that preserving your assets without giving the whole farm away and how to properly hand it down. 
Well, I think the, the, the and that's, that is exactly correct, is that somebody didn't get the right advice mm -hmm. in how to deal with that particular asset as part of settling the estate. And, and that's what we see so often is there's hidden pitfalls. Um, you know, people don't know what the right questions are to ask or even who to ask the questions of. And so the, the important piece here is to make a plan, um, you know, to take the time to do it. You know, we're here, um, you know, it's summertime um, and people spend how much time planning their vacations? You know, the, the statistics show that, they, you know, they spend days, you know, every year planning their vacations and, um, and how much time do they actually take to plan their own um, estate planning? And it's very, very little. Yeah. And so taking that time to plan, the, the key elements oftentimes are estate taxes. Many people think about estate taxes, but estate taxes aren't a big issue for most people because now you can have over $12 million of assets per person uh, and qualify and not have to pay any estate taxes. So a husband and wife could have $24 million and not have to worry about estate taxes. Te uh, I think Teddy's going to have to worry about it. Teddy's a wealthy individual over there. He's a, he's a high, <laughs> high wealth. Uh, Teddy Republic, dude, Republic. He's a high wealth individual. Teddy, if you, you need to gift some of that money to me, I'm, I'm certainly open to it. So Dennis, sorry, I think I stepped on you there a minute. I, I thought you were done. I, my apologies. No, that's quite all right. Um, but I think, you know, the point is that instead of, instead of um, you know, state taxes being the issue for many people, it's they worked out their retirement, but if they're ever going to need nursing home care or need assisted living care, um, that's going to really ruin the finances and they may run out of money um, during their lifetime. And that's where we want to make sure that we've got things protected. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we had a, I just will call it from Lisa, a partial question here. So I think there needs to be more context, but she says, what if there's a pending divorce? And, you know, I, I don't know at what point she's referring to. Uh, is it, what if, I don't know, if you're going to create a will, but you're going through a divorce. How do you word it? <clears throat> what about if, then you subsequently get divorced, you know, do you need to go back? I would hope and go back and change the will to reflect your new marital stuff. Help us unpack some of that stuff. And Lisa, if you want to clarify that a little bit, please go ahead and, and we'll, we'll take it from there. Yeah. So um, yeah. this would bring up two questions for me and Lisa may have something else in mind, but I think one is exactly what you mentioned, Randy, which is if someone has documents in place and then they go through a separation or they go through a divorce, they really do need to update those documents. Yeah. Um, no question at all. Um, a little known but big fact is let's say a person's married and then they get separated and they've got these documents in place and they've named their spouse, soon to be ex-spouse, as the agent under their power of attorney and given them some broad act of authority to uh, you know, deal with finances, and that sort of thing. Well, the fact that they're separated does nothing to remove that authority. So that means that this spouse, soon to be ex-spouse, still has the ability to deal with bank accounts and um, real estate and things like that. And it needs to be, you know, obviously updated and changed. The, the second situation where I think this is really important is the idea that we've got mom and dad and they're leaving assets to the children. Many times um, they simply leave everything outright to the beneficiaries. So maybe there's three children. They say, whatever's left goes equally to my three children. And what happens is once that child receives that inheritance, then it is at risk for what if they get divorced? Yeah. Or what if they have a great job and COVID hits <laughs> and then they have you know, no job and big debts and people are gonna come and sue them for, for repayment. So the idea is that we can protect the beneficiary's inheritance from possible future divorce, from possible future creditors, uh, from you know, death or disability and money winding up going outside of the family, there's definitely some uh, beneficiary inheritance protection that can be happen too. And it that, wasn't, you know, go ahead, Randy. Well, is that it, Dennis? You can see the Lisa's chat. Can mm -hmm. you see it? Did that, did you address her? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's it, what I'm thinking. I, I, and I think, again, it, it really goes back to the question of many people think of, well, I need a will so I can divide things mm -hmm. up between my kids and that's good enough. And as, as Lisa's bringing up here, but there's more that can be done and parents can really do a favor for their children by doing that extra planning for them. Before we go on, um, this was not a movie, but I bet you there's been a movie that included this scenario 
where um, you know the, the the filthy rich dude divorces the first wife, marries the 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 new wife, doesn't change the, all that beneficiary information, and you can see where this movie's going when he passes away and the new new wife's like, okay, I got all this money, and nope, didn't happen that way. So. <laughs> uh, it may be a movie, but I guarantee it plays out every day in real life. Hey, I got a, I got a joke for you guys. And, and Dennis, I'm sure, well, Teddy, I, cut me a little slack. I'm going to tell a joke. Anyway, joke is, <clears throat> joke is this guy, this guy's got an elderly father, right? Elderly father, guy's wealthy as all get out. And the son's going to inherit this thing any day now, right? Because the guy's on his last leg. And so he says to this fine looking young lady who's much too young for him. He says, Hey, he said, uh, you ought to, you know, get up with me because I'm going to be a multimillionaire as soon as my old man kicks the bucket here in the next little bit. And she goes and finds out who the guy is. And then three days later, she says, Hey, I'm, I'm not looking to date you. I'm your new stepmom. <laughs> so, Surprise, surprise, it's surprise. Not it's not just a movie. It happens in real life. I'm so. sure it, it I'm sure it, I'm sure it happens. Uh, here's another one that uh, Don threw out, and, and that is alcoholism, drug addiction, that kind of thing. If you know what options does a family have to maybe challenge or remove that person who was designated as a power of attorney if they've got some of these issues and are making perhaps bad decisions. Uh, however you want to define bad decisions. Um, what kind of recourse do they have in that case? Uh, I, probably if we were looking at this sort of situation, it would start mm -hmm. with the language in the document. The yeah. document may have some provision for how or when somebody um, is named as a successor to the current power of attorney. The other two um, considerations I would, I would throw out there, number one is it's probably not enough to say that they may make bad decisions because that's probably not going to be enough um, for the courts to come back in and say, well, you're not doing a good enough job. Yeah. Um, and then the other side of it is that sometimes we have to go through the extra step of going beyond the power of attorney to do that guardianship, which then trumps the power of attorney. But it's something, like I said, we try to avoid guardianships if at all possible, but sometimes that they're necessary. Yeah. And, I, and Dennis, you've been very deliberate in your words, which I respect and understand. And you've used this phrase a couple of times now. It's about the words that are used in the document. And if you don't have the scenarios covered yeah. uh, for these types of you know, ideas that may happen, then your document is not going to protect you as you would hope it would protect you and your assets and your family. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that is so true. And, and the, the context I would put that in is that we all hear about, well, we'll learn from our own mistakes, Yeah, you know, which we do. We learn from our own mistakes generally. But in this situation, what we really want our clients to do is learn from other people's mistakes. Yeah. yeah. And the idea that, you know, you, you can't make all of the, all of the mistakes yourself. Other people have made these mistakes. We've seen mistakes that they've made. Yeah. And that's how we try to help our clients is they can learn from other people's mistakes and benefit from them yeah. and not make those same mistakes themselves. Yeah. And unfortunately, there's a lot of unscrupulous people out there who are self-serving and will get in the way. And we just got to hope our lives are not wrapped around them. Hey, it's a 1230. You're on Lunch Conversations with Randy and Teddy. For those that don't know, I'm Teddy and the bald guy. is. Can I call you bald guy? I've been called worse. <laughs> the bald guy is my buddy Randy. And our special guest is Dennis Toman from the Elder Law Firm. Hey, Dennis, this is a half hour break. Tell us why people should call you and your, and your staff. Please. Oh, sure. I'm glad to do that. Um, so I, I am so blessed to have a very good team of people here who have a lot of passion for working with clients, helping them through. And, you know, one of the things that we, you know, questions we pose to people is, you know, what would you want if you had the right plan in place? And really the, 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 the um, feeling in that situation, number one, they, they like to make sure that they're they're benefiting their family or making sure the people that they want are getting their assets um, ultimately that they're taken care of and their wishes are respected. But they also want to have that supportive understanding, you know, listening experience with a trusted advisor 
to make sure they get the right plan in place. And that's really something that we excel at is understanding that, you know, everybody's situation is different. Everybody has different goals. Where all of this conversation has to start is what's your worry? What's your concern? And what would you like to see happen? And then make sure that we've got a solution that's actually going to work for that person and, and uh, implement it in a way that takes uh, the advantage is that we, like I said, we've had a lot of experience at this and uh, got good people, we'll get that done. And that's, that's what we really help people through. In that, uh, in that second half of our lives, there are a lot of things that we need to take care of. And there's a lot of things that we want to do. Worrying about estate yeah. planning is something that really will get in the way of us and really enjoying that second half. And that's why um, I'll even re uh, restate, co contact the elder law firm in Greensboro, North Carolina, 336-396-4551 and have a conversation with Dennis and his people. And again, I'm gonna reiterate this, you must tell them that Randy told you to call. So Dennis, thanks a lot for hel helping me. Hey, with that Dennis, talk. I gotta, I gotta ask you real quick here on, uh, you, you talked about people spend more time planning their vacation than yeah. retirement and, and such. And I, I don't disagree with you. I think it's a, <clears throat> you talk about having that discussion and Teddy, I think you just mentioned about, you know, that's awkward or putting it off. And I, I don't know, is it, a, a, is it because, Ooh, that's a morbid thought. I don't want to have to think about dying or I don't want to have to make tough decision. What, what do you feel like, is the reason that people punt this thing down the road and kick the can down the road, whatever euphemism you want to use. Why is that such a hard decision uh, topic to tackle? And maybe if not now, then somewhere in the show, I'd like to get some pointers. I'm sure others would too, to say, how do we initiate this kind of discussion? Because it's not necessarily a fun one. Right. Yeah. yeah. And um, I think, you know, for some people it's, it just happens um, that that conversation happens because one of the things that's a core value of theirs and that they want to make sure um, that they accomplish is not to be a burden for their family yeah. and not to leave a mess that others have to deal with. And so for a parent who is in that situation, well, then that just happens naturally and they get the right plan in place and they do things as long as they don't procrastinate. Right. Um, and I think just in context of why don't a lot of people do this? Well, one issue, of course, is that the definition of old age, and it's been studied and, and uh, you know, researched, is anybody that's asked, well, what is old age? And they say, well, it's about 15 years older than I am. You know, old age is that somebody who is in their 30s thinks 45 is very old. Um, somebody who is, is 80 thinks 95 is very old. They're not old. Somebody else is older. Um, and so it's the idea that, that people never see themselves as being um, in that situation where their age is really going to um, you know, be important about well, what if they become incapacitated. Yeah. And then I think again, the idea, it's never going to happen to me. Yeah. And so one of the things that we always do, and we're talking with families is, of course, Alzheimer's and dementia is a big part of our practice. Mm -hmm. And something that never used to be talked about. And we do bring that up as part of the conversation. But the other is oftentimes to put this in terms of less about, well, what if you had a stroke or what if you had Alzheimer's or dementia? And it's more in terms of, well, what if the, the bus came along and you got hit or you had a bad car accident? Those tend to be the sorts of things that people say, well, that just might happen to me. I'm never gonna have a stroke. I'm never gonna have Alzheimer's, but you know, I might have a car accident. Um, or the bus might come along, the proverbial bus, and I get hit. So those are those are things to kind of bring up. And I've got a few other pointers too about bringing up that for yeah. uh, you know, having a conversation with parents. Yeah, we'll, can we do that now, Teddy? You want to do that we'll, now? We'll or? bring that up. We got a couple more points before we go into okay. having those yeah. conversations with uh, you know with old people like Randy. Because I mean, I'm watching it all around me. Everybody's get, all these people are getting old, and I'm sitting there going, "Man, I got to help them." So let's, 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 let's talk about uh, another vi uh, mechanism or vehicle. You may tell me a different word to use, trust, types of yeah. trust. And, you know, why might they be important to people? Yeah. So again, this goes back to the question of what's the right estate plan. And for some people, just having the very basics in place is going to be the right estate plan. And it doesn't have to be complicated. It just needs to be done and reviewed periodically to mm -hmm. make sure things haven't changed. 
For other situations, we need to consider some sort of trust-based planning. And why is that? Um, well, the, the basic uh, concept is you're getting your estate plan, you've got your powers of attorney, healthcare, financial power of attorney, you've got your will. Well, your powers of attorney are in fact during a person's lifetime and then they stop when the person dies. Mm. And, and then the will is signed obviously during the person's lifetime, but it doesn't start until after the person dies and after they go to court to get the authority to take the steps to follow up the instructions <clears throat> in the will. The point being that there, the will is simply a set of instructions and it has no authority. The courts grant that authority. And that means that everything has to go through the court process to follow the instructions of the will, which can be avoided if we use a trust-based plan. Hmm. Um, a a trust-based plan starts during a person's lifetime. It continues beyond their death. And it can last for years, um, generations even, uh, you know, beyond the person's death and has that arc of continuity that makes the whole plan. And we don't have to go to court to, to provide the authority. The, this trust has both the authority and the instructions in it, and it simplifies that whole probate process. So that's where we start with the concept of trust-based planning. You just uh, threw a wild idea at me and I'm being facetious with my $16 billion portfolio I have in my mind. But, you know, I, I would picture that based on the model of trust start when you create them and they continue in per perpetuity until the, the tr trust is designed to go away. But maybe a trust doesn't go away. Maybe a trust stays in place forever and it it provides uh, uh, growing assets that serve nonprofits that you want to donate to, your family you want to give money to, et cetera, et cetera. So trust can be, I'm picturing an idea, it can just live on for as long as it can live on. It can. Generally, what they're going to do is they're going to live on through the individual lifetime and then be divided up among the children yeah. for the children either to receive or for the children to have full access to during their lifetime, yeah. um, which was the beneficiary controlled trust and how to protect in the event of a divorce or a lawsuit. That's where adding that sub trust under the parent's trust for the beneficiary of the child. And then if the, if the child were to pass on, then it would go on to whoever they decide or generally to the children, the grandchildren. And that's an attractive thing for the grandparents too, yeah, yeah. knowing that the money's gonna stay in the family. <laughs> Randy, how do I spell wooden? I need to put it, make, make sure it's right on the document. It's with a D, not a T, my friend. So uh, get, 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 the, get the spelling right. <clears throat> I can just imagine too, I mean, if you talk about the wording on documents, what if, if a name is typed wrong on a, a document um, and is still signed. I mean, if the signature's there and there's a typo, uh, the name is spelled wrong or something. Does that nullify anything, or what? What's what's uh... it adds to the the confusion, obviously, yeah. and yeah. It takes extra steps to bring that clarity back to it. And yes, it could be the source of lawsuits that could last for as long as the money lasts, yeah. basically. <laughs> Um, it's, with a, it's with a D, Teddy, not a T. It's a double, D. Double R, double S, buddy. Get it right. Double R, double. <laughs> yeah, and we're, we're, I mean, we're joking about this, but this is real important stuff. I mean, yeah. I, 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 I don't care. I mean, I have, I have known families with minimal assets be destroyed because someone did not have the forethought of putting a plan together. You know, I, I've, I've known families who, have, and Dennis, I know you know these stories. You know, I've known families that, you know, were devastated because it wasn't done properly. And um, and I don't want that to happen. Randy? You know, I have a question. And you see this sometimes it comes up in celebrity, you know, news or whatever, where they have a will. But then the guy is, you know, on his last legs and his mind may not be there. And his, you know, his 22 year old uh, girlfriend. <laughs> encourages him to uh, edit his will. And like on a handwritten piece of paper on his deathbed, he goes, I give all my money to someone, you know, Betty um, Boop. Betty Boop. <laughs> it, a, does that actually, ha is it enforceable? Does it happen? I mean, don't they have to notarize or do any, or can I just on the back of an envelope, just say, you know what, I'm giving it all to Teddy Burris because he's a great guy or it, it 
doesn't there have to be a process at all in this yeah. thing? That's so the types of wills, I mean, brought up a number of issues there, uh, Randy. But <laughs> Sorry about the what, thing. One is, <laughs> okay. one is, yes, you could um, do your own will, handwrite it, and it could be effective and overwrite previous wills. Really? And that's right. what's often called a holographic will, hmm. which is generally going to be the source of lawsuits because it's rarely done right and often includes ambiguities and uh, just is a big problem. And so sometimes people do try to handwrite a will and it could be effective, um, but whether or not it's effective it has to meet all of these requirements. And I won't even go into the, because it's just a bad idea from yeah. the start. <laughs> so uh, the, the second part of it is when someone prepare, signs their own documents, they have to have the capacity to do so. Yeah. So they have to know enough about yeah, why yeah. they're doing this to be able to have an effective signing of the will. It's called testamentary capacity. And then another ground for um, uh, challenging this type of a, a document, a will, or a trust that's got testamentary effect um, would be undue, undue influence. Yeah. So if somebody is under undue influence, then their will is not going to be valid. But to determine that requires a court action. Mm. Yeah, yeah. True story. Wow. There's a um, an old farmer in Maryland. His name was Herman Rabbit. Rabbit. Herman Rabbit. A true Herman Rabbit. True story. Uh, I'm a farmer sure. named Rabbit. Yep. He um, he had a farm. Okay. He uh, bought and sold cattle. <laughs> he would go to a cattle auction and he would buy 500 heads of cattle. He uh, packed his lunch. He ate uh, out of a brown paper bag. I mean, it's very very frugal farmer. Um, unbeknownst to most people is filthy rich. He would take his lunch bag, rip off a hunk of paper, and he'd write, Herman Rabbit bought cattle, pay this guy five, six, whatever number, thousands of dollars. And he would sign it, and he'd hand that piece of paper to the guy he bought the cattle from. And the guy's like, what the is this? And Herman said, you take that to you know, Smith and Reynolds Bank or whatever the name of the bank is, they'll give you that money. Sure enough, the bank, and this is a true story. It was, you know, I, I saw it on the news. I didn't see it on Facebook because this is before Facebook. They interviewed the, the bank guy and he goes, I knew that if a brown paper bag came in with Herman's signature on it, I had to give that guy the money. So we can't do that now, Randy, just an FYI. <laughs> uh -huh. But, uh, so, all right, here's another big one. We got a few more minutes left. We're good. Uh, estate administration. What does that mean? And, you know, how do I make sure my estate is administered appropriately to, to move it to where I want it to be moved? Yeah, so we're really talking about settling the estate. And the question is going to be, does it go through the courts or not? Yeah. And of course, the idea of it going through the court, sometimes that's the right thing to do. As we've talked about the probate process, um, the good thing about the probate process is there is somebody looking over the shoulder of the person who's doing it. And so it, it needs to comply with uh, the, the, um, the law and, or else they're gonna be held personally responsible. Um, the bad news is there's somebody who is looking over the shoulder and it's an expensive proposition to go through all of that. For most families, they don't need to go through the probate process if they have the right trust-based planning in place. Yeah, yeah. so um, I get it. I mean, it takes time. I mean, and yeah. you know, I'm dead. I don't care how much time it takes, but my family would, and there may be yeah. need, need, needs for them to, to have those funds and to be able to do the right thing. Um, uh, quick question, writing a, uh, writing a, or getting a will put together, do you just have it and have it filed at a with a lawyer or a trusted agent, or do you file it in some government space? Am I making any sense? Yeah. So when someone signs a will, it doesn't get recorded anywhere. Okay. It doesn't put on get put on record. There are some counties that will allow you to um, store it there, but it's not really um, put on any sort of a record yet. Really, what happens with the will is you keep it. Okay. And sometimes the lawyer will keep it for you. More often, they'll say, you keep the original, we'll keep a copy. But you'll need the original when um, it comes time to make the will probate. Yeah, and if, they, if they've lost the original, there are ways of going through a process to have a copy um, admitted to court too. 
but the will is typically not not put on record anywhere um, in that situation. Got it. And we've got a few minutes. I'd, I'd like to circle back to that whole topic of <clears throat> how do we bring up a discussion? That's where we're going about, next, buddy. Go ahead. Yep. Take it. And I remember my, uh, you know, it was, it was more of a health issue with my, my ex-father-in-law uh, who was in declining health and still wanted to maintain his independence in his, you know, his house. He, he was a widower. Um, and that was a difficult uh, discussion to have uh, about relinquishing that and moving into, a, a, you know, a nursing care kind of facility, let alone the whole financial thing. And he may have had that all worked out too, but the healthcare issue, because I, I, I was part of that discussion and it was a very awkward one. How do you have these kinds of talks with people who otherwise are in pretty good health? And where, how do you approach this kind of stuff? You mentioned about the bus, but I mean, give us some other pointers on how we do this. Yeah, and of course, everybody's yeah. different. And yeah. you, know, you know your parents better than, than I would. Um, you know, the kids know their children better than, um, you know, as someone else. So everybody's different and they may have some yeah. intuitive ways of going about that too. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> one, um, one way of dealing with this that some children have found helpful is to talk about they've gone to their lawyer and done their estate planning and mentioned that to their folks in, at an appropriate time when there's you know the space for that conversation to happen and say you know we've gone ahead and taken care of this and we felt that it was very important and I feel so much better now that we know that this is going to turn out well for our family what what do we need to talk about um, you know I'd like to make sure that you've got things in place so that you're not worrying about it and so that's one way of opening the conversation is to talk about your own, own planning. Um, a, another key pointer on it would be, you know, one of, the, one of the true things about life over the years is everybody acts in their own self-interest, ultimately. Um, what, what is their self-interest? What is important to them? What do they want to see happen? And so for many times, if we're dealing with, for example, not, you know, situations that have over the years, and particularly with the older generations, a, a husband is, is very concerned about his wife's, you know, well-being, and that things would be okay for her if he wasn't there. And so sometimes to get that conversation started, it needs to be that, that, you know, look, you know, if something were to happen to you, how do we know that mom's going to be better taken care of? And we're going to be here for, but there are things that, you know, we want to make sure that you take care of. And on the other hand, many times the parents' concern, though, is really for the children. You know, they don't care about themselves. Um, you know, they know that they're going to be okay, ultimately, or things are going to just, you know, happen. Um, but they do want to make sure things are better for the children or for the grandchildren, for that matter. So putting this in the context of what's important to them or telling them about some of the horror stories. Yeah. that have happened you know I, I had a friend whose parent you know wound up getting hit by a bus and you know they had to go through this process of guardianship because they didn't have powers of attorney in place or I had a friend whose parent wound up going to the nursing home and the nursing home required that the house be sold and all the money went to the state and nothing went to the children and then the parent was living on $30 a month because that's all Medicaid would allow them to keep you know, bringing up some of those horror stories uh, can can also be effective. Yeah, yeah, I'm good at it. Wow. I, I, absolutely. And, and unfortunately, maybe that's the right word, but you know, it's it's called life. Unfortunately, those horror stories are painful for others. And you said this earlier on. It's one thing to learn from our own mistakes. Well, some of these mistakes we can't learn from because it's too late. But it's but it's important for us to hear these stories as horrible as they are for others so that we can go, that ain't going to be me, which by the way is why I wrote down a bunch of things for me to come back and talk about later on. Cause I don't want to, I don't want it to be me. Um, so, and by the way, Dennis, if you get hit by a bus, there's lots of upside to that, to the family and I'm being stupid, <laughs> so, but, uh, but this is important. I mean, these conversations are really important and uh, I, I'm uh, fortunate uh, my father-in-law, has no problem talking about death in a very respectful way. He has no problems talking about, you know, after I'm dead. Now, my grand, my daughters, his grandkids hate that because 
you know, they, they're, they're like, he's not going to die. It's Papa. He's not going to die. Um, but you know, and he, because of my relationship with him and hearing him talk about death in a very respectful way and the things that go on and we have to deal with and work through that's teaching me not to have a problem having those conversations. And I wish more people could, unfortunately that's not going to happen. So I think that's a great, great thing. And and Teddy, one of the things, you know, sometimes you talk about this as being, you know, planning for the unexpected. And in fact, it's not really unexpected. It's more untimely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so all of us need to have these conversations with our children, with our parents. Um, I ask sometimes, and you get the right advice, because I ask sometimes people, when will you know if you've got the right will, the right trust, the right power of attorney? And the answer is they'll probably never know, because either they won't be here or they won't be able to understand what's going on. It's too late. And so yeah. get the right help. Make sure you've got the right uh, plan in place. Yeah, you, you got to do, in my, my model, my view in this whole conversation, you have to put thought into doing what you can do today and knowing that you're following guidance and, um, you know, from experts, you can only do what you can do, but you damn well better do something, uh, you, or, a, you know, or you somebody quick, else is going to take control over the situations. Quick question for you, and this uh, pertains to state law. Uh, there's not a federal law for this, I assume, but each state in the U.S. is different in how it deals with wills and powers of attorney and such. So are there are there certain because we have people that are watching in living here in North Carolina. We have others across the globe. Um, are there certain unique things about North Carolina law that are just outliers. It just, it just doesn't happen to, or, or are most states pretty much the same overall? Yeah, the, the language for gifting differs by every state. Okay. Um, gifting and powers of attorney. And so that needs to be watched and done care, pretty carefully uh, between the states. One of the things that North Carolina is a little bit of an outlier on is the idea of if somebody doesn't have a will and they're married, um, if they if they don't have a will and they, they're married, then the state's will called intestacy does not leave everything to the surviving spouse, which is a big surprise. So, for example, if we had a young person, they're married, they don't have any children, and one spouse died, then that the assets of that that deceased spouse that aren't held jointly or just in their name would have to get split between the surviving spouse and the deceased spouse's parents which comes as a real surprise under a testacy especially um, if they're deceased themselves you well know. if the parents aren't around then then that's obviously not going to happen um but if the uh, um, okay. that, that would be the situation and the other situation is well if it's a married couple um no will they do have children again some part of the estate's going to go directly to the children not directly to the spouse yeah is that subjective to the court the, the percentages no, the percentages are in the statutes. Okay. Uh, okay. So that's that's what happens. Yeah. 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 And so, that's different in different states. For example, I know that some states it's just presumed if, if you're married and die without a will, everything goes to your spouse. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, let me yeah, I gotta write this note down. <clears throat> and I know, uh, for example, you can make it so that uh, let's say if the spouse is already dead, then you can divide it among your kids. But but if the one of the kids is dead. By the, you know dies before I die, then the let's say that third money does that then you know we can make that go to my grandkids from the deceased son. If that I, makes I got sense. the answer, or, Dennis. We, it's all in other based words, they, on the words in the document. You can make it say whatever you need to say. I guess that's the point. I remember my grandfather had said. Uh, uh, he had three daughters and he said, and, and the will was kind of, kind of murky a little bit. And I don't know whether they ever got it squared away. This is a long time ago, but he said, uh, each of them will get a third of a third or something like that, which is really a ninth. And it, he meant to say each of the three daughters will get a third of the, the estate, but he said, it'll be a third of a third. And I don't know that they ever got that squared away. So I don't know, live and learn, I guess, but, yeah, uh, yeah. So, uh, you hate to make those mistakes. Teddy, we only have a few minutes left. Good. You want to going to do Dennis, this? Dennis, uh, I, I appreciate this conversation, man. Really, uh, I, I won't use the word timely, but very relevant to all of us in, in lots of different ways, either for us personally, 
or for us and our our older adult, uh, you know, family members, and um, really enlightening. And so thank thank you very much for a coming on the show and hanging out with Randy and I. It wasn't so painful, was it? No, it's very pleasant. I really appreciate the time together. Got a, got a couple of takeaways you can share with us, uh, for the audience, the, the couple three takeaways you'd like folks to remember? Well, I think I'll probably just leave with, with really one big one, which is, and I, and I actually heard you guys talking about it, so you got to put thought in this, but then you got to do it. Yeah. yeah. And probably yeah. The, the, the single biggest problem to proper estate planning is procrastination. Mm-hmm. People yeah. think about it and then they don't do it or they spend their time gathering information and they don't do it. And so um, it's absolutely critical. And whoever you work with, don't have to work with us, but you know, whoever you work with, work with somebody that's got the experience, um, the understanding, um, you know, the knowledge to be able to get you where you want to go yeah. um, in terms of having the right uh, plan in place for you and your family. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. So Dennis, again, yeah. thanks a lot for uh, coming and joining us today. Um, and, you know, thank, thank you to the elder law firm for supporting uh, lunch conversations of Randy and Teddy. Um, I really do appreciate that. Again, if you look up the uh, elder law firm in Greensboro, when you call them, tell them that Randy told you to say hi. And Cindy, thanks for being on here. Uh, thank you to all of our audience. We got a really diehard, great group of people. Uh, who show up on a regular basis. Thank you very much. Uh, If you ever have another thought about a topic that you want Randy and I to bring to the show, we have some really cool ones that we're working on. Really will blow you out of the water with the uh, the stuff that we're finding, but we're always looking for more conversations that you would think would be beneficial. Um, So Randy, you want to close out? Who's there? No, I don't really have so much a a story. Next week, I got it. Go ahead your your guess. I'll introduce Okay, I don't really have a great long story, but I think just to kind of echo what's been shared is to make a plan. Yeah. To to make the plan, and um, to not have a plan is is a, another decision entirely, um, and it can lead to mm-hmm. a lot of strife. And you know, I haven't necessarily seen it in our family, um, but I know of other families where there really was no plan in place. Not only was it expensive, I guess the whole probate thing, but you get a lot of bickering back and forth and how you divide furniture and how you divide this, that, and the other. And, um, and I always tell people, Hey, nobody gets out of here alive, you know, and your material stuff you can't take with you. Yeah. You like to have things. Um, but it just, it's sad to see what can happen to relationships and families. And I would just hope that we'd be more patient and understanding. Teddy, why don't you take us out of here and tell us about our guest and we'll hit the road. By the way, Randy, in my will, you get my microphone. Just saying, buddy. Uh, so next week, <laughs> next week, Kenneth Lang is going to be our special guest. Kenneth is a, um, a really cool guy. I met him a few years ago. He's um, not only is he involved in career transition and helping people, let me put it over here so I can see it, not only in, in uh, you know, helping people in career transition and have conversations, Kenneth refers to himself in some way or another as an introvert. And so we're, Randy and I are going to bring an introvert to the show, which by the way, dude, you and I have to be a little better. Um, and Kenneth is going to talk about how as an introvert, can you have good, meaningful conversations whether it's in career transition uh, or it's in business, he's going to bring 10 tips for introverts that we can use in lots of different ways. And so, uh, and Kenneth refers to himself as introvert, but he's a really engaging guy, smart as a whip, uh, exactly what Randy and I need on our show to uh, to compliment us. So join us 11.55 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, every Wednesday for Lunch Conversations with Randy and Teddy, sponsored uh, by the Elder Law Firm. Dennis, again, thanks, buddy. Randy, I'll say hi another day. All right, see you. Bye.